important is that I'm an avid uh, martial artist uh, with Aikido and what's called a Vado, which is the way of the horse. Um, the what I try and the premise of Aikido is ending a conflictual situation as peacefully and gently as possible. Hmm. And I try to bring that into everything that I do, whether it be relationship or horsemanship or working with clients. So that was a piece that was not on the bio. It wasn't until I met you that I understood that there's a whole world of therapy that involves horses and humans and the, the, the blending of energies between them and all the things that you learn. And it's through our conversations that I've had a, a, a much deeper appreciation. One of the things that you and I have talked about recently that is fascinating to me is the, the topic for today's conversation, which is how long do you think in your professional estimation it's going to take for us to move beyond uh, the trauma of COVID and the disruption uh, we've had for the last 18 months. And, you know, it's, it's no signs of abating right now. Yeah, the last 18 months have been a really big deal with the number of deaths and injuries from uh, COVID. Uh, generally speaking, uh, it takes approximately three generations when things are going well to move through trauma. Uh, what I mean by that is if there's abuse in one generation, would you like me to keep going with this? Really yeah, quickly? keep, please keep. Yes, this is. Um, there's, if there's abuse in one generation, when it stops and parents have a child and then that child has children and then it's that third generation that if things have gone well in the first two generations, it's that third generation where the energy of the trauma no longer is running the system. So the, the thing that, that I, I'm not smart enough to understand, and which is why I want the, the questions, is we have, as, uh, as people, and this is all over the world, this isn't just isolated us, we've been locked inside. We've been locked down, mostly, for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I, it feels like that's created a pressure cooker for emotions and a pressure cooker for abuse. That is accurate. And, and not only for emotions and abuse, but isolation, okay. uh, lack of attachment, lack of support, lack of, of community. Um, one of the things that uh, happens and and one of the things I think a lot about because I work with families so much and I work with a lot of times families with very young children is the idea of and this is touches me deeply is the idea of an infant seeing this for the first oh, the time mask. in their life the mask. the mask and not seeing our whole faces and also not having a community to support um, you know, say a couple has a, a young child, an, an infant, gives birth to an infant, and all the caregivers, all they're saying is this, we're actually designed to see our whole faces and our whole bodies uh, to be able to pick up on what's going on in our environment. So just that will be something that will affect three generations down the line, much less all of the loss and uh, lack of, of connection in COVID. I mean, we've lost 700,000 people. Right. That's 300,000 more than we lost in World War II. Um, so, um, and it's not just the children that are affected, it's, it's all of us who are affected. In my practice, I'm seeing people who are so disconnected. And, and that's one of the big pieces, like, Trauma and loss create isolation, yeah. create lack of connection, create lack of uh, work of relationship. We're designed to be in relationship. We're designed to be okay because we're in relationship. Um, and that's that's been a really big deal. I heard a word early on that you said that 
I'd like you to explain because I know it's a it's got a lot of meaning. It's the word attachment. Yeah, attachment is that is that bond that we create that actually makes our world okay. I have a developmental mm. model that I work with that I've actually worked. I've I've made a developmental model that's actually usable in therapy. A lot of the other people have made developmental models. They're good. They're right on. There's nothing wrong with them, but they're not that usable in therapy. Uh, when we are working with attachment or struggle with attachment, we don't feel like the world's an okay place to be. Mm. And the core of what of all of the models of attachment is, is that where we create trust and where we create attachment is being able to go through a difficult time in relationship and come out okay. Part of what's happening in our world with COVID is that we go through difficult times and we're not coming out okay. 700,000 people did not come out okay. That has affected more than 700,000 families, much less all of what has gone on with the the uh, long-term COVID and the illnesses and the and then all of the strife in our country around how we're dealing and working with COVID, no matter what perspective you have. So we, we I'm very curious and have been interested over the, the 70, 74 weeks now I've been doing the show um, about the impact of a lot of these things on early childhood development and you'd mentioned that you deal with families and young kids which i i think gives you a unique perspective have you ever actually talked to the parents about the long-term forget covid just the long-term effect of how they are showing up for their kids because the kids are modeling behavior after the parents i'm just curious how how that works well, right now, the long-term effect, particularly of isolation, is, is dramatic. Um, one of the big things that's happening is, is that parents are not getting the support they need. Mm. So when parents are not giving the support they need, it's really hard to be getting up four or five times in, in the middle of the night to, to feed, to get their child to the hospital if they if something is going wrong um and the level of isolation that's going on is it's dramatic and the um so part of what's happening and it's a really interesting piece is that because of the isolation kids tend to go to one end of the spectrum or the other oh how's that one is where they the child wants to remain isolated because that's where they feel safe. Oh. Or there's a push to be with somebody all of the time and where it's like, I didn't get this, so now I'm gonna go 180 degrees from that and be with somebody all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. Um, and it, this is affecting families deeply. My neighbors who we're very good friends with, their oldest daughter is five, Sunday, we had a planned party where we were going to give all the kids pony rides because I have one of the cutest little ponies in the world. <laughs> and that got canceled. It's like, we can't do pony rides. People are too afraid. And, um, and literally, the, the little girl who was next door was, we can hear enough. She, she was sobbing because mm. she couldn't have pony rides with her friends. And so then it's like, how do parents work with that? How do parents work with the loss right. of, of being able to give their children what they want to give their children? Because if we can't give our children what we want to give them, that's not only a loss for them, it's a loss for us. Because right. giving our children what they need and deserve is that's why, we're, why we become parents. I'm... I'm curious about resources because it, and resourcefulness that there it is, it's resourcefulness because this, this sense of being disconnected, there's some of us who live on the hyper connected side and we've kind of figured out. And then there's, there's the other side, you know, introverted, extroverted, ambiverted, mm -hmm. that's me in the middle, um, <laughs> where, where 
and and so our our ability to find these answers is really challenging us what have you seen some successes in there or seen some things because it's a it is a different world now to, to your point i can't have a pony at, a, at the kid's birthday party so where where does the parent go i mean are they aware enough that this is like a big deal and they should be paying attention to it and they need to resolve it or is it just man i just got to get through the day Oh, there's a lot of just getting through the day and a lot of being worried about, am I going to, is the world okay? And am I okay? Both from their perspective, but also for their children. Um, the other part, and this is a really interesting piece, is a lot of our connection is now coming through two dimensions instead of three dimensions. And the two Explain. dimension, it, it's what we're having right now. I've got it. It's like, I can see you, I can hear you, but man, if I'm having a tough time, I can't sit next to you and right. have you put your arm around me. Right. You know, I can't sit next to you and just say, wow, I had a tough day. I can't sit next to you and, and have a meal together and just chat about the day and chat about what's going on. So the two pieces where we can have three dimensions, Hmm. at all times is in nature okay we can have three dimensions in nature and be safe right now we can have three dimensions in nature i mean with with animals with dogs with horses with with even being outside and what birds with putting up a bird feeder for instance so the places with, with animals and with nature we can have three dimension even in the most dire situations around the COVID stuff and around that's, the long-term stuff. That's interesting. And I'm guessing you're also going to say that that is a, well, that's a really powerful and easily accessible thing to do for most people. I'm sure there's going to be some cases, but even if it's like, if I can't, hey, I can't have animals in the apartment, but I could put up a bird feeder and that's a fun thing right. for the kids. I can put a bird feeder up on the balcony. I can, almost every place has a park nearby of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, like, the, like the parks and the foothills of Colorado here are like more full than they've ever been full. Oh, good. Um, and so we can literally create attachment through nature. We can create attachment through being in nature together with our children. Um, and because what the biggest piece that transfers from one generation to another is a lack of attachment. Oh, so please, I need one, to hear, tell me, what do you mean? What the lack of attachment passes? I don't quite understand that. Well, let's say I grew up in a family where there was no attachment where my okay. parents were not available to be attached yeah. to. Yeah. What's going to happen is that I will not learn how to attach. I see. I will not learn what that means. So even if I want to begin doing that when I have children, I will be going, how do I do this? I know I'm supposed to do this somehow. I know I'm supposed mm. to do this somewhere. Mm. Mm. But it's mm. like, I'm, I'm literally trying to figure out how to provide an, a place for my children to attach when I don't even know how to do it myself. And is the hope that uh, your spouse uh, grew up in uh, an attachment rich home, hopefully, and will bring that. And then now, now we start to learn what that's about. And then those children of that marriage start to see something that's it's not it's as much attachment as the mom is or able to bring or the dad is able to bring. Right. And then their children understand that. So it's, that's how it goes. Well, hopefully that can happen. Or oh. if, if there's an, if there's a, because part of what happens is that we tend to gravitate towards spouses who are like us. Oh, so very, uh, if I yeah. don't know how to attach, I probably will not, be, I will not gravitate toward a man or a woman who knows how to attach, or they won't. They won't be satisfied with. I was just going to say you're not very attractive to someone who's 
used to attachment. Right, exactly. That makes sense. So if we can grow together in that, that's, that's wonderful. However, when we have the kind of loss that we have, when we have the kind of disruption of attachment that we've had, that, that makes it tough. So one of the pieces that actually will help ultimately with, ultimately with getting through three or four generations of recovering from COVID or the kind of trauma that we're experiencing at this point is a community-based effort to provide attachment as much as we're able to do that and a community-based effort to actually provide being in nature because, uh, and again, being in nature, uh, I'm not talking about being out in the wilderness in Colorado. I'm talking about literally sitting under a tree with, uh, and just breathing and, be, and being outside. Um, Do we think, I wanna just, I wanna butt in there for a second just to, that, that was such an important piece. And I want people just to kind of write that down and think about that and think of, about how, as you said, come together as a community, um, people who are hearing this to be able to share these ideas with friends and family. Yeah, right on. 